Yeah, good. Hello and welcome to The Hill here on News Nation. As there is a major question tonight about the fate of a possible border deal, a bipartisan group in the Senate working for weeks to find a compromise to potentially start fixing the crisis. But tonight, there is a new element. Donald Trump. How the former president's presence could suddenly scuttle a deal. Plus, is a hostage deal in Israel in the works? Who President Biden has dispatched now to head overseas? And should the U.S. enact trade barriers against China to win the electric vehicle battle? What Elon Musk is now saying. Thanks for being with us here on The Hill. I'm Blake Berman, joined today by Sir Michael Singleton. Republican strategist, Kara Frederick, director of the Tech Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation, Michael Starr Hopkins, Democratic strategist, and Chris Hahn, former aide to Senator Chuck Schumer, News Nation political contributor as well. The Hill on News Nation starts right now. All right, come on in. Thanks for being with us here on the Hill on News Nation. We start right now with a look at Eagle Pass, Texas, where the state and federal government have been battling for quite some time now over how to best solve the immigration crisis. And a live look at Capitol Hill, where a bipartisan group of lawmakers have been trying for weeks to hammer out a deal that would address the southern border, along with aid for Ukraine and Israel. But tonight, would you look at this headline here from the Hill? Quote, Senate GOP pleads with Trump, Donald Trump, not to kill Ukraine border security deal. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell now acknowledging that a deal could be tougher than even he thought. Why? Because of Trump's opposition to a potential border deal. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in. Um, Donald Trump. Is he running Congress right now? I mean, I wouldn't say he's running Congress, but I think the former president recognizes uh, how significant this issue is for the American people. And this is an issue where Democrats, including the president, struggles with. You have- but he's saying no deal unless we get everything. And even Mitch McConnell, who's like the ultimate Republican sure. insider, is saying, well... Maybe I didn't even acknowledge well, sort of well, well, how hard well, look, this was well, going to well, be. Look, let, let, let me be clear about this. I think there is a significant detachment from the establishment wing of the party versus the base. Okay. There's a reason why I believe individuals of the Freedom Caucus have played such a pivotal role in directing policy on the House side. You're now seeing this on the Senate side. Now, we can agree or disagree on what this means in terms of stabilization legislatively, okay. but I think the president is speaking for the base of, of the Republican Party right now. Speaker Trump? You're exactly yeah. right. Well, I mean, why not? because it's a bad deal. And that is the mm. point. You're exactly right, Sir Michael. What it does is it gives Biden extra cash to make the border crisis worse. It, uh, some estimates, it gives Ukraine unaccountable Ukraine military funding to the tune of $60 billion. The American people don't want that. The American people want something like HR2. They want responsible, accountable Ukrainian military aid, if at all, and responsible Israel aid. And it's a bad deal. Michael's, so been, le- Michael's no. been leaning in for the last minute. <laughs> Let's just call this what this is. You guys want to keep immigration on the playbook for right. this election. And so Trump is spiraling the deal. That's what right. it is. I mean, in a democracy, a border. In, a, in a democracy, Democrats come with their proposal. Republicans come with theirs. Yeah. We merge them together and you come to some sort of bipartisan Optimize. agreement. Sure. That's what sure. this is. I mean, this Kirsten is why, Cinema this is, is why, leading this. This is why people hate Congress. Yes. This is why nothing gets done in America. There's always an election less than two years away. In 2013, there was a similar immigration deal struck in the Senate. It passed the Senate with broad bipartisan support. Boehner didn't take it up because the Freedom Caucus, I don't know what they're calling themselves then, wanted the issue for the election in November. This is the problem in America. And Donald Trump, look, he wants to make this the issue. The issue is going to be that he scuttled this deal and he doesn't care about the safety and security. That's what what Democrats are going to bring up. But he'd rather uh, not politics than everything else. Because that's what Democrats are going to bring up. And I'm sure you're going to say not the case. But just within the last 20 minutes or so here, Trump has sent out a statement. And here is what he has said. Quote, we encourage all willing states 
to deploy their guards, the National Guard, or the, the guards from their states, to Texas to prevent the entry of illegals and to remove them back across the border. So I asked you if he's running Congress. <laughs> he's is, running. This a, is this a shadow presidency right now? Because you've got him clearly trying to influence Republicans yeah. in Congress, yeah. and now Republican governors as well. I mean, I think this is an effort by the former president to showcase to the American people what he would do if he were to return to the White House. That, that, that's what I'm... I'm assuming here. With that said, what we saw today were Republican governors across the country, members of the RGA, all releasing very similar statements saying we stand with Texas. So clearly there's consolidation within the party in terms of this issue. There's consolidation, but it's around Trump. Whatever he says, you jump, Republicans jump. This isn't, you're not trying to get to the root issue. You're trying to deal with a political issue right now. But Michael, can I raise this point that this is an issue that the president struggles on? That is a fact. That, which is why we have a deal it's, that's it's, a bipartisan deal. Well, not yet. Yeah, they're well, still trying to hammer it out. For sure. But we, we have the leg that every president for the last 35 right, years decades. has struggled on, yeah, Republican okay. and I Democrat. And now there's consensus around a deal, just like there was in 2013, by the way, when Obama was president and Biden was working this deal out as president of the Senate. But, but I might why didn't Democrats and, and now there's a deal. Control Congress but the first why does that matter? This is, this why is why a Republican priority. This is not so a Democrat. Democrats. So it's priority. a Republican priority that I, I, now they I'll, are getting I'll, what they want, so and the Democrats need something that's called compromise. It's called checks and balances. So, how so, you work so things Democrats out. Believe in unfettered Look, immigration. I don't know so, what Republicans believe because the Republican Party platform only says we support Donald Trump. But what did you guys right? believe? Which is clearly what's going on right here. What did you guys uh, believe in the first two who, years of who President Biden's administration? Because who, you didn't we believe we needed to get the economy back on track. We need to get the economy back on track because Trump buried this country. Let me take a ruined the economy of this country. Let me take a time out. Let me take a. He did. Out. Hallelujah. Hold on. Time out. <laughs> I'm going to take the full. By the way, I'm going to take a full. I'm going to take the least a, attractive person on this cat panel. I think I'm going to take, take a three minute time out here because I want to bring in the Democratic congressman uh, from the state of Texas, Henry Cuellar. Just returned from a trip to Mexico City. He and his fellow members uh, of Congress met with top Mexican officials about what they are trying to do to control the flow of migrants across the border. The congressman, as I mentioned, is from Texas. Thanks for being uh, back here on the Hill on News Nation. Appreciate it. Um, so let's start with the news moments ago. Donald Trump telling governors to send their guards to the state of Texas. Good idea or bad idea? Look, uh, I was just listening to a panel that almost sounded like the U.S. Congress, you know, so divided and everybody <laughs> has a position. So I, I, I was really enjoying that conversation. Look, I, I think, look, uh, we already saw what the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has already said in 24, uh, 2012, uh, the Arizona case that it is the federal government that has the power to enforce immigration law. No matter how frustrated a state might be, it's the federal government. Does the state play a role on immigration? Absolutely. But they got to coordinate and communicate with the Border Patrol. Uh, but to say we're going to ignore the Supreme Court uh, and move forward and stand up, you know, I hope we don't have a clash of Title 32 and so, Title so would you 10. Be, you, so would you be for it? Would you be for it if there's coordination? Uh, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I worked with the state. I used to do the appropriations for DPS and the military down there. I've done that in the past. They play a role, but they got to coordinate with the federal government. But to say we're going to kick you out, out of this Shelby Park and we're going uh, gonna to do whatever we want to, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Coordination and communication has to be key, and a state can play a role, but not to play long range of politics. Uh, I mentioned you were with the Mexican president yesterday, Congressman. What did he tell you? You know, it, it's interesting. I think they're now understanding that uh, this migration issue affects Mexico the way it affects us, uh, because I'll tell you why. There's a couple of things Mexico is doing right now. What they're doing right now is they're getting some of the migrants to the southern border, and they're actually deporting people. Uh, maybe they need to do a lot more, but they're deporting people to the countries of origin. And the U.S. is starting to do that, but we need to do a lot more. That is, we got to deport people that don't meet the qualification for asylum and deport them. And by the way, they actually have more people at their border than we have uh, actual border patrol. So they're doing their part, but I think we can work with them and address this issue together. Uh, Congressman, one of your colleagues, uh, Joaquin Castro, Congressman from from your state, is suggesting that maybe um, that maybe President Biden needs to take control of the Texas National Guard if need be. Does he have that right? Uh, Does he have that wrong? 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen that, but I actually, before that statement came out, I did send a note to the White House, uh, and I said, this is Title 32, this is Title 10, where the president under Title 10 uh, can go ahead and federalize the uh, National Guard. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I want to present this to you all, and you all make a decision. I guess they haven't decided there, but under Title 10, the, the uh, State Guard actually has... Are they considering it? The government as far as you the, know? I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I gave them, uh, okay. you know, the the two uh, powers under Title 32 and Title 10. I sent it to the White House, uh, and, and I understand what Mr. Castro is saying, but it just, it's one of those things we should not be fighting each other. We ought to be working together. Okay. Congressman Cuellar, i got to leave it there. appreciate your time, as always, sir, and we look forward to talking to you again here thank on you the so much. Congressman Henry Cuellar from Texas. Uh, thank you, sir. What about that? It's, it sounds like he's pitching it. To, uh, I mean, look, uh, the National Guard's not a toy, right? These state governors thinking about sending their guard troops down to the border. It, there's a significant cost. There's risk. Remember what happened the last time uh, some of these guardsmen got injured a, a, in this deployment. Uh, I think that if uh, Texas continues to buck the courts, which they seem to be doing, they're going to need to be treated differently and their guard will need to be nationalized. I don't know about uh, the rest of the National Guards around this country. And I'm hoping that the governors ignore former President Trump's statement that he made from a courtroom where he is being charged with defamation. Uh, I hope they ignore that uh, and they just go about their business and do what's right for their state and, and, and stay out of this. I would just say there is a precedent for federalizing troops. We did it so that we could get children into segregated schools. We've done it before to make sure that to quell unrest. There, there, there is a precedent for this. Okay. All right. Uh, meantime, elsewhere today, uh, President Biden and the economy getting a, a, a bit of good news. We learned that GDP grew by 3.3% in the last quarter. The president was uh, out uh, today, I believe, in the state of Wisconsin. And um, this was how he responded to that economic news. I, I think it's a mistake to assume that everything's hunky dory. And, you know, and when stock markets are up, it's kind of like this little drug we all feel like it's just great. You know, but remember, we've had so much fiscal and monetary stimulation. So I'm a little more on the cautious side. That, of course, is not President Biden. That is someone who might want to be president say, one day. Good. Uh, that was Jamie Dimon saying that the economy is not hunky dory. If we ha- or is maybe not hunky dory. If we have the Biden soundbite, let's please cue it up because I'd like to get to it. But this was. Uh, pretty good news yeah, for the economy. Yeah, Everyone right. wants to root for the economy. Look, but, I, but what about what Jamie Dimon says, right? Maybe not everything's hunky-dory. We've seen these mass layoffs, uh, some of the biggest companies already in 2024. So are y'all celebrating this? Or, I mean, are you on the defensive here? Look, I think wages are going up, but the problem is prices aren't going down. And I think there needs to be a conversation with corporations about, about the price gouging that's going on. There isn't an excuse for McDonald's having Big Macs that are causing or costing $9. Like the prices of things I think corporations are taking advantage of. And I think there needs to be a societal conversation about how that's built in. I mean, look, wages have not gone up with inflation. And when you look at the uh, employment numbers, a significant portion are actually individuals in the gig economy, part-time yeah. work. And so we're not seeing people finding jobs where there's a 401k, yeah. where they feel some level of stability so, and, and comfort. And that should be concerning. I mentioned, hold on, I mentioned President Biden. Here's what he said earlier today. Things are finally beginning to sink in. We passed a lot of really good legislation. We knew it was going to take time for it to begin to take hold. But it's taking hold now and turning the economy around. Well, thanks to the American people, America now is the strongest growth, the lowest inflation rate of any major economy in the world. All right, so that's the argument that, that he's making, Kara. Con- Consumer no, is, confidence no, is coming numbers, back. Okay, but these numbers are entirely fueled <laughs> okay. by borrowed money. Yeah. And that is the big problem. A lot of government so, spending. Well, a lot of government debt. spending. Everybody can't deny that. Borrowed funding when Trump was president. Hey, he was we, the, the king of debt. He okay, called himself the king of debt. Let's see the facts now on the ground. The Heritage right. Foundation, we have new analysis coming out, which the debt has increased by $834 billion, yet the GDP has only increased by $328 billion. That means we're growing debt twice as fast as the economy to keep the charade Here's going. The American people numbers. have it's to feel real. it, right? We've had this conversation a couple times, you and I, Blake, over the last year. Uh, you know, the president's saying things are getting better. The American people didn't feel it. 
What the numbers are showing now is the American people are starting to feel it, and by November, they're really going to feel it. Well, look, I, That's I, I the problem that, for the right in this country, because I mean, it's always about the economy, and the economy is doing better. But what he's got to be I really mean, careful of is looking like he's taking a victory lap. That's the problem. Too soon for that. It's too I soon for a victory yeah. lap, but he's got to make sure that he's reminding the American people that things are starting to get better so uh, they I, feel it, while also not looking like... I think like he's got to take credit, like, I, I think terms, he's take credit for some in, stuff, in, though. In terms of electoral politics here, i got to agree with Chris. If it does get better where people start to fill it by November, this is a problem. If it Are you ready better, to th- if it th- looks better, if it looks better, not feel. gets feel. better. Feel. 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 If they feel, all they got to do is feel. feel. They, do they is don't got to look, they don't got to know. If they feel it, by the way, one of the, this, one of the most interesting numbers. Feel the power. Feel it. I love sitting between these One of the most interesting numbers I found from New Hampshire on Tuesday was Republican voters there were asked, what's your top issue? It was economy 37 percent, immigration 30. Yeah. And that's the first time in the Republican primary. That's the first time we've seen that number start to come closer and closer closer together. All right. Coming up still here on the Hill, Israel's mission to destroy Hamas. Both sides have been at war for several months now. Well, now the United States top negotiator is headed overseas. So could a deal to free hostages be in the works? Plus, is he running for president? The new comments from Joe Manchin today about the race in 2024. That is coming up (laughs) live from the Hill, live from Washington. News Nation, back in a few. And by the way, hello to our friends on Sirius XM. Hey, hey. Hey. All right, welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation. So President Biden is sending the CIA director as top negotiator, uh, William Burns, overseas. It's part of an effort to potentially broker a deal to release the remaining hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. It also comes, as back here in Washington, Senate Democrats are voicing their disagreement with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over his opposition to a Palestinian state after the war with Hamas is over. Two different issues here, but let's start with... um, top negotiator going overseas. What is this signal? Do you think it's, what what do you think a deal could potentially look like here? Look, I think that this shows that Democrats are serious about this, that we're not making a lot of noise, but we're doing the behind the scenes work, that we're meeting with foreign uh, dignitaries and trying to use third parties, uh, third party countries to facilitate transfer. At the end of the day, there has to be a two-state solution. I don't see a world where we can have this done. Does there have to be? He says it has to. No, no. Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005, so they have been living side by side. And look at the vestiges of that. You get October 7th. You look at the atrocities and the barbarism of October 7th. I don't think that's going to work. And I think it also is important to remember people, to remind people, 34 Americans are dead after October 7th, and six are still being held hostage. So credit to them that they're sending Bill over there to, to negotiate. I hope he's a better negotiator but than Hamas Lincoln. The PLO. And actually get some results, but different. that matters. I mean, I, I have a, a bit of a different approach here. I mean, I would love to see the United States work with Israel to work with the Palestinian people who want a free society. Mm-hmm. That is very, very important right. to me for us as a leading country in democracy to help build democracies and centers where people desire that level right. of freedom. Okay. I agree. Right. With, you agree. With us yeah. now, uh, Dan Senor, former policy, uh, foreign policy advisor, rather, in the George W. Bush administration, also host of the podcast, Call Me Back. Speaking of Call Me Back, he is a frequent visitor uh, here on the Hill. Dan, nice to talk to you again. Two, two stories you here, and let's take, yeah, of course, two stories here one by one. Um, the CIA director going over there to negotiate, uh, trying to get all hostages back. I, I would guess that that would be part of some grand deal. If there is a, a major deal, a, a grand deal here, what do you think that looks like? Uh, I think a grand deal, I mean, it's hard to know exactly, but it would be some version of a very long ceasefire. Uh, there's been talk of something like up to two months uh, of a ceasefire, the release of a lot of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli prisons, and a path by Israel, a late, late, the Israelis lay out a path to some sort of two-state solution, some sort of Palestinian state. I think the challenge here is that as Israel gets deeper and deeper into Gaza, into the south, past Khan Yunus, and even in farther south than, than that part of central Gaza, that is where the leadership of Hamas is. And that is where many believe that a lot of the hostages are because the hostages are being used as human shields around the leadership of Hamas, like Yehia Sinwar and Mohammed Def. That's, they want the hostages there because they think that's their last, last line of defense. So as Israel gets deeper and deeper into that area, not only do they risk the lives of Israeli soldiers who are going into these dangerous areas, including underground, but there also is a real risk for these hostages uh, right. that, that the Hamas is hang on to, which I don't think they're going to want to be so quick to let go of. 
What do you make of these 49 Democratic senators calling for a two-state solution right now? It's basically a, a, every Democratic senator. Uh, I think it is fine in principle. I have no idea how you implement a two-state solution anytime in the near term. You have the leadership of Hamas saying that if they could do October 6th, what do you mean by near again, term? When you say near term, what, what, what is near term in your view? I don't see a Palestinian state, an actual real sovereign Palestinian state being created within the next year or two. Uh, you could have state minus, you can have a Palestinian flag, you can have some of the infrastructure of sovereignty. You're not going to have a military, a Palestinian military as part of a state. They're not going to be responsible for securing their border with Israel or with Egypt. You have the leaders of Hamas right now saying they would do October 6 all over again. You have Hamas leaders outside of Gaza, like Khaled Mashel, who's basically saying the river to the sea and from Russia Rosh, Nikra down to a lot. They want the whole thing. They want all of Israel. They want all Jews out. And the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, which many look to as a possible government for, for a Palestinian state, right. has still not condemned what Hamas did on October 7th. And they are still indoctrinating their young people, providing rewards for terrorists and their families that kill Jews. So there's no obvious administrator of a Palestinian state. So that's what I mean. It's right. fine in principle. It's an abstract conversation. It's just totally hmm. disconnected from the reality which was there was a genocidal attempt on Jews in Israel on October 7th, and there's no way you are going to get Jews living in Israel feeling comfortable with any resolution, right. especially Jews living that they who want to move back to southern Israel, until that area is secure. And I don't see a Palestinian Dan state so far that can give them that security. Dan Senor, got to leave it there. Uh, thank you for the time, as always, and I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, guys. Chris, I'll give you the last word. You got to have an option, right? I agree. Hamas is horrible. They're terrorists. They should have no role in any future government that is in, in Palestine. That said, you got to move to a situation where those people are self governed. You can't have an occupied territory indefinitely. That is the wrong answer, and that's what Netanyahu is saying. 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 Yeah, because it's not an occupied territory. That's a talking point. And I think Dan nailed it. It's an abstract concept. Unless you've had your boots on the ground, unless you really understand this, yes, we can all think that, oh, civilians, everyone desires freedom. That was the biggest mistake we made in Afghanistan. You know, I did three tours there, and I found I bought into the whole neocon. Yes, everyone, George W. Bush wants freedom. No, they don't. Not, no, not everyone wants freedom. Some people just want a rough and ready sense of justice well, and well, security. And well, civilians... Well, no Nobody wants an occupying power. Reports. Nobody wants an occupying power. It's not power. an occupation. Well, look, that is a, they pulled out some point, Look, at some point in the future, and I don't think it's immediate, at some point in the future, they're going to have to self-govern. Somebody's got to come up with a framework, and that framework doesn't exist no. yet. They've so chosen that they can how do they that. want to be governed, no. and they've chosen. The children who are running Hamas away have not chosen over anything. Over and over and, over again. and we got to keep, we got to move on. I am Speaking very pro-Israel. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Speaking of moving on. Because we could talk about this all day. I know. Got to move on. Still much more ahead uh, here on the Hill. By the way, have, have you heard about this? A drug overhaul in Oregon. Former President Trump, by the way, testi uh, testifying in court earlier today. Plus, he doesn't have all the delegates yet. But is the RNC ready to give Donald Trump the label of presumptive nominee? There is a new document out today, a new proposal. And Nikki Haley is responding. Plus, is it flush with cash? Or not? Yeah. Why does a toilet in San Francisco cost north of a million bucks? We're back here on the Hill. Well, this got interesting this afternoon. Uh, that broke uh, mid-afternoon. Um, how about this question? Do key leaders want the Republican Party to move on? <laughs> Some leaders of the Republican National Committee are now circulating a draft resolution, and it says in part, quote, the Republican National Committee hereby declares President Trump as our presumptive 2024 nominee. Now, the committee will vote on that resolution next week. Here's how Nikki Haley's campaign is responding to that. Quote, who cares what the RNC says? We'll let millions of Republican voters across the country decide who should be our party's nominee, not a bunch of Washington insiders. <laughs> May Millman, former Trump White House attorney, director of the Independent Women's Law Center. Come on in. Hello, May. Um, what do you make of this? Uh, basically, party leadership potentially next week saying, you know what, he's, he's the guy. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. So this is a David Bossy proposed resolution. And David and explain Bossy, who David Bossy <laughs> is, is, is a, a Trump longtime staffer. I mean, okay. one of the early, like if you were to say the first right. five people. So um, he's proposed this 
they're going to think about it. They'll vote on it. There's been a lot of pushback already. And frankly, you know, it's David Bossy is not stupid. It's not a bad idea for the Republican Party to consolidate. But I think the way that the Republican Party does consolidate is not this, right? The way that it happens is uh, Nikki Haley, other candidates before her, have to see, um, have to test out whether they can go uh, against Trump. And if they can't, then they should suspend their campaign and either support him or not. Are you of the view view that this race is over, May? So I am. um, I'm a realist. Uh, (laughs) Nikki Haley (laughs) might think South Carolina is in play. um, But for anyone who's been to South Carolina, the people there just, they don't support her like they support Trump. They don't hate her, but they don't love her. So I just wanted to get May's take real quick, but around the table real quick on this proposal, she basically, you heard May, good move, bad move, go for it. I think it's a bad move. Bad move, okay. Real quick, just real quick. Consolidate behind Trump. But this way? Like May said, the way matters. I think let it, let them fight it out at the ballot box. Republicans are always going to do that. And uh, yeah, but consolidate behind Trump. You've guaranteed she stays in the race now. You've made it harder for her to get get out out because of this. I mean, making him the nominee... It also just shines a light on the fact that 50 percent of Republicans don't want him and he is presumptively their nominee already. Right. This everybody's looking at this the wrong yeah. way. His he is being he's losing these primaries in a lot of way. If he was an incumbent president right now and he was only getting 50 percent of the vote, they'd be looking for yeah. a new candidate. Now I feel bad for cutting you off because well, I'm sorry. Time, so go for <laughs> I mean, look, I was just going to say simply, Nikki Haley is probably going to get out within the next two weeks. There's already chatter among some of her donors, some of whom I know that there isn't a path. When the money starts to dry up, the candidate is is faced with the harsh reality that I cannot continue. Hey, May, um, Nikki, uh, Donald Trump, rather, uh, if we could pop up the... the the statement that he made, basically trying to cut off the money to Nikki Haley. He said, quote, anybody that makes a constant contribution to bird brain is the name for her. <laughs> from this moment forth, will be permanently barred from the MAGA camp. We don't want them and will not accept them. Uh, what's going on here? <sighs> yeah, I mean, this is obviously not helpful if Trump wants people who are sort of on the fence, um, who either might not vote or haven't traditionally voted Republican, whacking Nikki Haley is probably not his best move. And that's why I say David Bossy is not stupid. It is <laughs> wise to try and end this primary and to have him stop beating up on Nikki Haley. Um, but he's not going to do it until the primary is over. All right. Uh, turning now and hang on by me uh, to to someone else with um, seemingly oh, presidential my. ambitions as well. The yeah, Democrats okay. love him. Uh-huh. He's the West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. Uh, he is in the key election state of South Carolina today. He's there right now, uh, speaking any moment now, actually. And he'll be heading to Georgia tomorrow. Moves that have many questioning whether he plans to join the 2024 field. And he sat down with next star's Rashad Hudson earlier today. Watch. I would do whatever if I think there's a way to unite the country and bring it together. I'd be open to whatever it takes to make that happen. Does that mean you, Joe Manchin, would run for president? That's a possibility. I assume that if you're looking at it and I'm saying what I'm saying, I believe so strongly in saving my country. I think you're going to know by Super Tuesday. Oh, shucks. Like, Joe Manchin is such a fraud. This idea that he's this common man, like, he's the epitome of the swamp. He's everything that, whether you're a Republican, independent, or or Democrat, (laughs) should be against. Like, he's talking about this is a unity thing. There's nothing unifying about what he's trying to do. This is a corporate play. Here's what he's going to learn. Nobody knows who he is. We do. We're right. political junkies. Right. The Beltway knows who he is. K Street knows Nobody who he is. Nobody in I... Georgia knows who he is. He can okay. walk into a Kmart in Georgia, and people will mistake him for the guy who's So isn't that why he's doing what he's doing? No. He's doing it because he's got hubris. He thinks everybody knows who he is. He thinks he matters. He didn't matter the minute the Democrats got 51 votes. Okay? Well, it's well, wait, done for wait. him. It's over for him. He can't get reelected in Virginia. Are they, and he's surely not going to be. Are they on to something Chris, or are they Virginia? worried? Chris, there's a lot of hubris it's on the dangerous. Democratic side, which is why the Republicans Well, you've got to have a little bit of hubris to be in politics, but we're on TV, by the way. Many Democrats don't want Joe Biden. 
So there is a reason you have Democrats like him, your congressman. They, they won't you're be right. running against they, you're your own. You're 100% right. I'm scared of him because a lot of Democrats don't want Joe Biden. Of course you guys. Uh, you are. and I have talked about I'm this. Not I think Joe Biden should come out and say to the American public, look, I know that I may not be your first choice, but it is me or Trump. And I think if he says it and or owns it, Biden it, Kamala oh, Harris. it pushes things. Kamala Harris it pushes people Nobody like Joe Biden Manchin Biden. and Phillips. It makes their, their whole candidacy irrelevant. Once he accepts that people, he may not be their first choice, but he's their only choice. May, what did you hear there? I want Joe Manchin as a third party candidate. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you he's and Kate 76 Street, no. years old. He's in the prime of his career, just like our <laughs> other presidential <laughs> nominees. Oh, uh, this is like what America money. wants. Just- yeah, <laughs> I want a Gen Xer. <laughs> what about um, what about these comments from Joe Manchin, though? Um, I think he hit on something earlier today. Listen. It's the greatest crisis we as Americans face today is the unsecured border and how it has been able to be taken advantage of. And hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are coming here that we don't know. I would say, Mr. President, declare a national emergency at our border and secure that border until we can come to grasp as Americans how we're going to continue on with legal immigration and stop illegal immigration. I haven't I haven't heard Democrats say that. I'm sorry. He acts like he's powerless. Right. He was the deciding vote in everything for the last two years. And now yeah. he wants to act like, oh, shucks. Oh, my God. It's exactly so right. It's so wrong that Democrats couldn't get anything done. We couldn't get anything. But because you it? blocked it but, but, because K Street gave you money and you blocked Mike, it. Can I just ask a, a little rebuttal here? Isn't it the job of the leader of the party, the president? To bring the party together, to, to unify around certain unlike issues. Trump, unlike Trump, Trump world, there's a deal on the table. There's a deal on the table deal, right now. He's so deal. influential that he wants to run for president. Get some Republicans in the Senate and some Republicans in the House to and get yet, this thing passed. You want to be president? Go do that yet, first. For two years, but you Biden guys propo- did so Biden because we had to fix the mess did Trump left us. He and we did. Biden now proposed you're excusing it. why you guys didn't do anything on Biden immigration. Biden proposed an immigration bill. bill. You think that people dying so, of COVID was a, was a, was a smaller oh, problem than immigration? I'm sorry, a million people died because Trump failed us. I will just remind everyone, Biden did Propose because an of immigration oh, You know what these things don't say it are killer political lies. That's what you, you know it. Just so, say it. I don't know it. Know it. Hold on, hold on. So, so, <laughs> so if Joe Manchin were to run or not, he's going to need money, yeah. right? Yes. Here's a headline from Politico speaking about Donald Trump, basically the super PAC that was backing him. Mm-hmm. Uh, ran through about half its money. It raised $46 million in six months. I think has 20-something million left. May, come on back. Oh, Last word to you. Does that concern you? Mm-hmm. So a lot of the reason why politicians need money is to build name recognition and to build a brand. There are very few people who don't know who Trump is or don't understand his brand. Of course, I wish that he was burning through less cash for uh, his legal uh, claims, but that's, uh, you know, that is the way that it is. And I think that once the Republican Party consolidates, um, I think that once you've got all the rest of the party rooting for Trump, I'm, I'm not concerned um, about the money, I should be, but I'm not. Okay, okay. all right. May Mailman, got to leave it yeah. there. Money's not the Thank issue. you. We'll oh. see you soon. I wish, May, that you were staying around for this next story. Oh. Uh, oh. But we'll see you soon. Coming up here on the May. Hill, you can call it the Royal Flush. <laughs> How did San Francisco spend almost two million bucks on a public bathroom, a toilet? San Francisco. That's next on The Hill. And be sure to check out our weekly newsletter, Decision Desk 24, our campaign view. It went out today. If you don't have it, QR code top right of your screen. It is a slice of our show into your inbox. Check it out. The Hill on News Nation and what is going on out west when we return. (laughs) Welcome back here to The Hill. So uh, Oregon's first in the nation law that decriminalized The possession of small amounts of drugs like heroin, cocaine, fentanyl, by the way, and other drugs could soon be reversed. Lawmakers there are now moving to undo part of the drug decriminalization law, citing a spike in overdoses and public use. Now, the bill would recriminalize the possession of small amounts of drugs as a low-level misdemeanor. Smart move? Terrible move. Why? 
terrible move. We're removing all morals and standards in this country. I think it's important to have customs of behavior. And I would argue that many on the progressive side are really destroying the fabric of our society. That's problematic. We need to stop criminalizing addiction. This country mm-hmm. is treating addiction like it's, it's something, a scourge. And it's, uh, it's really, I mean, the fentanyl crisis in the middle of the country on both coasts, it's something that, like, personally, I think we really need to change the way we think about it because but putting people in jail. But can do that without decriminalizing? I think we've got to figure out a way that yeah. we don't criminalize people's behavior, but also don't promote access to drugs. That's fair. Uh, that's fair. You said it better than I could. I think that's right. I think it, it, this is a problem that doesn't have a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, it affects every family. My brother, unfortunately, died uh, from drug use. Uh, and uh, I've seen it in my professional life, working as a chief deputy county executive in Nassau County. It affects everyone. Yeah. Okay. And, and everyone wants the people who are using the drugs to get better. And the law doesn't always let that happen. So we got to figure out a way to balance that. Yet the world runs on deterrence. So if you don't impose costs on people who are dealing drugs, possessing drugs, if you just make it a slap on the wrist, I say recriminalize it. I think recriminalizing is a good idea. We almost had all of you agree on one. We do kind of agree on something. Dealing and buying, I think, should be treated differently. You punish the dealer. You don't criminalize the the, the person buying. There can be degrees of gradation here. But look at what happened with pot. Even people on my side, the, the right, they said... Oh, you know, let it, let it run amok. It's fine. It's not going to hurt anyone. Now we have studies coming out saying younger users of pot are experiencing psychosis oh. at rates that we haven't seen. Young, like Drake said, there's, a, there's on, levels to this people stuff. should that, not be using yeah. pot. Yes, but, 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 guys, but you, you know have something? to impose costs, and then people will stop the behavior. That's going to shape. You know what I think behavior. we're missing here? Why are people going in this direction? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Education is failing our people. Jobs, the economy, it's failing people. Mental health. That's something we need to address in this country. And oftentimes we never address the root of the problem. I'll just say that is an issue. I'll just say this about marijuana. I know potheads and I know alcoholics. Alcoholics will try to punch you in the face. Potheads might give you an awkward hug and steal your Doritos. So, you know, let's, 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 A wave of car break-ins and robberies is causing the company to shutter one of its restaurants in Oakland, California. Meantime, back here in Washington, D.C., a CVS store is closing down next month after a string of thefts left its shelves empty. This is in northwest D.C., down the street from us here. Well, look, this is what happens when you have a movement that says remove police. I'm not surprised that this is what's occurring, and it's mostly impacting low-income people of color. I'm from here. You think this is a result of, like, the the defund the police movement and what's gone on the last few years? I think this is absolutely a a product of the relationship between police being afraid of the people they're policing and communities being afraid of the police who are supposed to protect them. And it's been a breakdown. Being from here, and I know where the CVS is, you've seen the crime breakdown. You've seen the mental health failures across the city. I think that's really where you're seeing a lot of this crime. Okay. Meantime, the city of San Francisco is facing backlash for using, get this, $1.7 million in state funds to install a public toilet, a toilet, (laughs) nearly 2 million bucks in the Noe Valley town square. Now the bathroom uh, housing it would cover 150 square feet. So if you do a little back of the envelope math here, (laughs) back of the script math here, 1.7 1.7 million. Yeah. Yeah. 1,500 square feet. That's 11,000 bucks a square foot state, for a no, toilet. No, real estate market is out of government control. Waste, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> waste run amok, and this is why San Francisco. This is why people are back San Francisco. This is why we people are leaving California from states we, we, like Texas. We got somebody here who's on the UFO <laughs> beat. Right? We have somebody here who's on the yeah, UFO beat. I have a feeling that this is some sort of UFO related thing where we're taking this money <laughs> and we're actually building a shelter for you. Uh, there is no San Francisco. San Francisco is not real. That. The only answer to that. Like, I never believed these stories. Seven, seventy thousand dollars for a toilet seat. It's been going. You know? It's it's been going. Uh, they've been building this thing since like 2016 wow. or 2017. It takes forever I'll to build what, there. I'd love they, to be the plumber installing that toilet. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 The jokes he, write themselves. His, <laughs> his, his kid is going to UCLA. Oh no, 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 no. So, <laughs> Gotta leave it there. Fun show, all. Thanks. Great to have you. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Change eyes. I'll, I, I still got a little bit to go. Uh, coming up here on the hill, Elon Musk sends a warning about China crushing the global market on electric vehicles without barriers. So Elon's basically saying, you know what? China is going to crush us on EVs. So should we put up barriers, tariff barriers to prevent that? You want to put up tariff barriers to help Tesla. 
That's on the other side of the break before the hell goes. RFK Jr., Cuomo, live. The independent presidential candidate gives his take on the race to the White House. Is America ready to choose a third party president? Tonight on Cuomo at 8, 7 central, only on News Nation. All right, welcome back to The Hill here on News Nation. Before we go, I want to take a look at one more story. Elon Musk saying the U.S. needs to enact some sort of trade barriers or else Chinese automakers will, quote unquote, demolish the competition on electric vehicles. Watch. The Chinese car companies are the most competitive car companies in the world. Um, so I think they will have significant success uh, outside of China, uh, depending on what kind of tariffs or trade barriers are established. Uh, frankly, I think if, if, if there are not trade barriers established, they, they will pretty much demolish <laughs> most other car companies in the world. Leland Vitter, host of On Balance. What's up, my man? Good to see you as well. It's kind of interesting, right? You, you and I were talking about this via an email uh, earlier yeah. this morning because, as you rightly point out, in 2008, uh, during the financial crisis, the yep. federal government stepped in and bailed out the, subs- uh, bailed out the auto companies. Yeah. Now, they were paid back with interest. The taxpayers mm-hmm. were. I think the big difference in this is the Biden administration has st- staked so much of its economic climate policy on electric vehicles. Right. This isn't bailing out an industry to save American jobs. Right. This is picking winners and losers for political you policy. Think so? Well, if they do, right? right? If you all of a sudden put tariffs on to save Tesla, right. that, that's a very different thing, especially when it's American consumers who end up paying all the tariffs. you got all these Republican governors now. I think there's like nine or ten of them who are writing, writing the White House saying... Uh, you know what? We need to push back the EV mandate. Here was, uh, by the way, Joe Manchin has said this. That's sort of like spitting in the face uh, of, yeah, about, of about, about the subsidies. About for, the subsidies. Yeah. yeah. Here, here was Joe Manchin earlier today. Right now, China has a complete, absolute dominant control all over the world. And I have said I'm old enough to remember waiting in line to buy gasoline in 1974 because of the oil embargo. I'm sure as heck don't want to wait in my life for a battery because we have an embargo from China trying to harm us. Joe Manchin earlier. Well, uh, also a a nice way to run for president if you're trying (laughs) to run for the middle lately. I'm going to try this talking point out. Look, I think this is a really interesting inflection point over the past couple of years because President Biden went all in on EVs. Remember, right, he was driving around in the Mm -hmm. F-150. And not talking about Tesla. Right. And Elon Musk was none too pleased because Tesla's leader in this country, and by the way, an American company. But go on. Uh, and, and the resale value of your Tesla is at stake <laughs> at this point, too, my friend. But uh, look, I think what's really interesting is what is the White House going to do? Because the EV, EVs have been exposed as not ready for prime time right yeah. now, especially over the past couple months. You had an election in, yeah. in six months. What do you do? By the way, uh, if it's Donald Trump as the next president of the United States with the EV incentives, and we know where he stands on EV, 